Hey, what's up guys? My name is Coco from High Street and I wanna welcome you to Church Online. Our mission at High Street is to love God, serve people and reach the world. We hope you enjoy today's content. Today we're gonna be taking um, a look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. That's the verse that Kyle just quoted. And uh, this is our memory verse for the week. So I wanna invite you to memorize this verse. Uh, and what I do in my journal, in case it would help you is, I begin at the top of every day by rewriting this, the verse that we were memorizing. Psalm 136, one was the one that we were memorizing last week. But let's take a look at this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Let's read it together. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now that's three simple instructions. And that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and for me. I think sometimes people wonder, how, how do I learn to develop a relationship with God? What does it mean to walk with God? What does it mean to seek God continually? Well, here's three ways. The first one is rejoice always. That sounds like gratitude, doesn't it? Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. You got a need, you got a problem, you have a concern, pray about it. And then third, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we're going to take a look at three ways to put that into practice. Uh, the first thing is this. We need to give thanks for the ordinary things of our life. Thanking God for the ordinary is a powerful way to remain in his presence and to stay with a grateful heart. A few years ago, there was an author, he, he, he writes all kinds of books. Um, he's kind, called a, sort of a lifestyle book writer. He does experiments and then writes books about them. His name is A.J. Jacobs, and he embarked on an adventure that became one of his best-selling books. He resolved to live one year according to all the laws and commandments in the Bible. Now, his book is entitled, The Year of Living Biblically, and at the beginning of the project, he described himself as an agnostic, but Jewish in name and heritage, but not in practice. But during this year, he decided he was gonna take a look at the Old Testament laws, and he was gonna keep them. He was going to observe the Sabbath. He would follow the cleansing rituals, the, di the dietary restrictions, even to the extent that he wouldn't shave during that year and he would not wear blended fabrics. He also began to tithe, which he had not been doing. He began to tithe, which he was surprised to discover felt really good to be generous. Jacobs also said that in his quest to obey all the Old Testament commandments, that he became overwhelmingly aware of a new sensation, one he had hardly ever noticed before. It was gratitude. He began to feel thankful, thankful for every little detail of life. He talked about getting on the elevator in his apartment building and being overcome with gratitude for an elevator. When was the last time you thanked God for an elevator? He, he said... He talked about um, being thankful to arrive at home. He was thankful for his wife, and he was thankful for the sight of his son. He said that gratitude became something like an obsession for him, that throughout the day, he kept saying to himself again and again, thank you, thank you, thank you. He wrote, it's an odd way to live, but also kind of great and powerful. I've never before been so aware of the thousand little good things, the thousands of things that go right every day. We need to thank God in everything, give thanks. In the ordinary. Can you think of five things today that you're thankful for? You know what I'm thankful for? I'm so thankful for running water. If you've ever lived anywhere in the world where running water wasn't always a given, 
I'm so thankful for running water. Because if you have running water, you know what that means? That means you can flush the toilet. Now that sounds a little bit, you know, base for a church service, but it's wonderful because when, when you don't do that, the house doesn't smell very good. I'm thankful for running water. I'm thankful for hot water. I'm thankful for showers. I love air conditioning and heat, don't you? I'm grateful to be able to come and be with you today. Honestly, before this pandemic, I was grateful, but I am after this pandemic even more grateful than I've ever known how to be. I have discovered how important it is to be able to see you every week. Now, I can't shake your hand yet, and I'm looking forward to the day to be able to do that. But, but you know what? I can say hello. I can ask how you are. I have people ask how I am. We can catch up. We can be together. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for this church. You know, I'm thankful for my, my wife and my five children. And I'm thankful for a grandbaby. I've never been able to say that before. Last night, I heard her fuss in her crib. I said, what's wrong with Eleanor, Robert? He says, oh, she always wants to be held. I'm just putting in her crib, and she's kind of adjusting to that. Her mom says, come on, Robert, pick her up. It's a good thing we're not there all the time, I guess. Can you think of five things, ordinary things, you're grateful for today? Number two, <clears throat> in everything give thanks means to thank God for the ordinary. It also means to thank God for the difficult times. To not feel entitled and assume that the world owes us our happiness and everything that we desire. We should be thankful um, for instance, you know, we, we, have grown, we have grown up in a very sort of entitled environment. I mean, we want people to not mess up. It, I mean, if you're out, we, we went out to eat this week with my daughters, and, and they treated us. This is awesome, actually. And the, the, the server was the only server in the restaurant, and this lady was so busy. And she kept coming back to the table saying, I am so sorry that some things are taking so long. And I, I said to her, hey, listen, we're having family time, so we're fine. You're doing great. We get upset so easily nowadays. Someone said, yeah, we get mad because the internet is slow. I hear people all the time say that, you know, these computers are so slow. Have you ever heard that? They're slow because it's going on the internet. The internet is going up, and up to space and back down. We've taken all of this for granted nowadays. You know that we live in a very entitled society when people are suing over frivolous things. Here are some things people have sued over. A convict sued a couple he kidnapped for not helping him evade the police. Who, who thinks like that? A man illegally brings a gun into a bar, gets injured in a fight, and then sues the bar for not searching him for his weapon. A mom files a, a suit against a preschool a preschool over her child's college prospects. This is preschool. A man suing for age discrimination complained that he didn't like the judge because he seemed too old. An obese man sued a hamburger store because of the tight squeeze in the booths. Apparently he'd been to that store too much. You know, you're feeling entitled 
when everybody's not cooperating with your plan and giving you the optimum experience of life and things get a little bit hard. One of my favorite stories, you've heard it before, you're probably going to hear it again because I just love it so much. People who think that they are so important they should be above everybody else, okay? There were um, people flying, three people flying in an airplane one day. Uh, the pilot came out of his chair. He, he grabbed a parachute and he said, the plane is going down. Your only hope to survive is to grab one of these parachutes and get out of this plane now. So the three passengers were there, and they looked around. There was an old man, a young boy, and the smartest man in the world, and only two parachutes. The smartest man in the world immediately grabbed a parachute, and he said, I'm the smartest man in the world. I, I've got to survive this. I mean, this is important for the world because I'm the smartest guy in the world. He grabs one of the bags and jumps out the window. The old man standing beside the young boy said to the young boy, Son, I've, I've lived a good long life. You've got years ahead of you. Here, you take the remaining parachute. The young boy looked at the man and said, Well, actually, there still are two parachutes, so both you and I can have one. The smartest man in the world picked up my backpack and jumped out. <laughs> you know, the truth is, we are not owed a perfect, easy life. Gratitude only flows when we don't have a sense of entitlement. Living with the spirit of ungratefulness is more than just an unbalanced way of thinking or improper manners. Uh, it's, a, it's, not, it's more than just a wrong mindset. According to the scripture, Paul says, um, being ungrateful is a sin. Romans 1.21, because although we knew God, the, the, Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 1 Corinthians 10, 9-11, Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. Now, let me just tell you the story there. The children of Israel, they, were, they had been delivered from slavery, they were in the desert, they were eating manna, they got tired of manna, they started to complain to Moses and Aaron, what have you done, you brought us out here in the middle of the desert for us to die? I mean really, do you think that was God's plan? Were they really thinking correctly? No. They said, we would have rather died in Egypt than out here in the wilderness. You know what God did? God doesn't like complaining. He sent serpents. And thousands of them were killed by these serpents. Why? Their complaining angered God. Verse 10, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were, they were, um, they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So God says, listen, grumbling and complaining. So here's the deal. If you are grumbling and complaining about something in your life that's hard, you can't be thanking God or living in a spirit of gratitude about that thing. Just count on it. If you're complaining, you're not thanking. So here's the question. As you sit here today, what are you complaining about? What do you grumble about? That's where you need to do some work. Have you ever complained about because God has not answered your prayer? You know, you pray and you pray and you pray and you don't get what you want. Has that ever happened to you? All of us pray for healthy babies, and sometimes we don't get what we pray for. That's my experience. In God and his sovereign plan does something that is hard for us to accept or understand. I remember the moment in my life when God did not answer my prayer to give me a healthy baby. At first, I grumbled and I complained to God. And over those months, I grew more distant 
and further and further away from God. I was angry toward God. I was confused by God and lost in my situation. I had to eventually decide that I would repent of my grumbling and complaining and I would choose to trust God. I would choose this verse, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so I had to just decide I was going to give thanks. What do you need to give thanks for today? You know, the problem with grumbling and complaining about our life circumstances or situation is that it actually says in Scripture that it, it brings darkness to our soul. That's not the way we need to go. And he reminds us in the New Testament that when people grumbled and complained against Moses, the snakes were sent. God responds to our gratitude in positive ways, but he also responds to our complaining and it's not positive. Third and last, we need to give thanks even in suffering. In everything, give thanks. Would that include suffering? You know, you can't wait for, per for perfect circumstances or perfect people in your life before you become grateful. Because if you wait for perfect circumstances, it's never going to happen. If you wait for the people in your life to be perfect, that they're never going to be. I read where this one lady said that when she gets so angry at her husband, she immediately stops and chooses to begin to thank God for the good things she can remember about her husband. You know one thing that kills a marriage? It's contempt. Someone who has walked down the path of complaining and fault-finding and criticizing and you know, when you put on the glasses of contempt, you never see anything good anymore. You only have eyes to see what is wrong and what is bad. And you bring darkness to your soul. This lady says, so I've learned that what I have to do is I have to, I have to start thanking God for the things about my husband I do appreciate. And she says, when I do that, it turns my heart around. David, the great king of Israel, who began as a shepherd boy, he did not live a perfect life. His life was far from perfect. He had many struggles and much suffering in his life. But in Psalm 16, he expresses his gratitude to God for his life. Um, in spite of the imperfect circumstances and the imperfect people of his life, remember David was the youngest son. He was the invisible child of his father. He was overlooked when the prophet came to his father and said, I'm looking to anoint a king in Israel. He brought all of the sons except for David. Did you forget a son? Well, I do have one young son. He's out watching the sheep. Bring him here. Because God told me, one of your sons is, should be anointed as the next king of Israel. Well, all right, go get David. That's an invisible son. You know what? He was the one who was picked on by his older brothers. His family life wasn't so wonderful all the time. And, but you know what? David <clears throat> endured that. And when, when he was a loyal and faithful and successful and good servant to King Saul, King Saul became jealous and turned everything around. All of the goodness of David was seen by Saul as trouble because he was jealous of him. And then David writes in Psalm 16, he says that the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. He sort of accepted his life. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Now, I hate cancer. I hate heart disease and 
I don't thank God for the violence that takes place in our society. When I hear the stories of people who weep as they tell me how they have been abused and hurt throughout the years, I don't thank God for that abuse. But, but you know, this passage is not saying for us to thank God for it. He's th- he says we should thank God in it, in everything. So in the middle of your illness, in the middle of the, the difficulties, and even the tragedies of life, the only way we can really come up for air and get hope is in everything give thanks. And what we're saying is, God, in the middle of this very painful and difficult time, I'm going to believe that you are still at work, that you still have a plan for me. I'm going to still believe that you are powerful and that you, by your very character, are good. God, I'm going to believe that you are the God who took a crucifixion and turned it into a resurrection. Never give up. Never give up on God because he's always at work Story after story in the Bible proves how God works during tough times. Joseph was sold into slavery, and then he was put in prison, and eventually he became the prime minister. And you see the providence of God as God saves an entire people through Joseph. Joseph was in Egypt, the right place, at the right time. These were painful and difficult circumstances, but God redeemed them. Um, God used Moses. Moses would had a death sentence as a baby. He was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, and he was allowed to grow up in the house of Pharaoh. But he noticed the pain and the suffering of his own people, and one day he went out to rescue them. And instead of that turning out positively, he found himself killing a man in defense of these slaves and running for his life. But God even in that moment, was still at work. God eventually met him in a burning bush and brought him back, and he rescued over a million people as he marched them out of Egypt. And when they got out of Egypt, they came up to the Red Sea. The army behind them, the Red Sea in front of them, there was no way out. And then God, what was God doing? God decided to put them in that spot, and then he told Moses... I'm going to open up the Red Sea. Step into the water and it will part. And it did. No matter what our suffering, I can be thankful that no matter what is going on, because I know God is still at work, I can be grateful. I can, I'm not grateful for the suffering or the hardship but I'm grateful for a God bigger than that suffering, bigger than that hardship. So when the burdens get heavy, we can be thankful that we have this verse in 1 Peter 5, 7, where God says to us, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. This is good news. We can take the verse, all things work together for good to those who, who are called according to his purpose. Not all things are good, but all things can work together for good. God comes to fallen, imperfect human beings. And he says, if you will just trust me in the good and the hard and in the suffering, I'm going to be there for you. That we can thank God for. You know, um, nobody gets out of this life without suffering. Family members die, people get sick, people in our lives sometimes abuse and hurt us and do evil things. Suffering is unavoidable, it's an unavoidable part of the human experience. What are we going to do with this suffering? And we're going to have to do something with it. We long to live in a world without suffering. I mean, that, that is not the world that we're living in. What we're longing for is heaven. This world, according to the Bible, is broken and decaying and groaning eagerly, waiting for the redemption and the restoration of all things. But what we can be thankful for is it is coming. The redemption of all things is coming. It is on its way. Romans 8, verse 18 to 25. For I consider... 
listen to this, is, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because of, uh, because, uh, the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope, for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with perseverance. Why can we endure suffering? Because we've got a great hope. We have got a great hope. You know, there was a man in the Bible who sort of is the icon of of human suffering and the struggle of trying to understand why does a good God allow suffering? I don't really have a complete answer for you. I have a lot of answers that I've read. But when I'm in the middle of my suffering, those answers feel a little plastic and thin. But the truth is that there was a man named Job a rich man with many children. And the devil came one day to God and said, you know, God, Job doesn't love you. He, really, he just, he, he, is, he loves you. He says he loves you because you've blessed him so much. But you take away his blessing and he'll curse you. So God listens and he says, all right, I will give you permission. I will give you permission to, to take away what he has. And at first he says, but don't, don't touch him. Don't touch his body. So Satan went from the presence of God. His wealth was gone like that. His children, all 10 of them, seven sons, three daughters, were killed when a natural disaster, a wind came and blew the house down, and they all died. And so in one moment, he lost his wealth. He lost his family. And then Job writes these words. Then Job rose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell to the ground, and he worshiped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away blessed be the name of the Lord in all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong you know what that is that's an example of in everything give thanks and he gave thanks. Now the story goes on and Job suffered some more. And the conversations through the chapters of Job are pretty intense, philosophical. Um, they're tough. My favorite part of Job is when he says in desperation, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I've just decided I'm going to trust God. I will have a heart of gratefulness in any and every circumstance because I believe there is a hope that awaits us. Now one thing to me that is so amazing is that when God came to save us, he had to go through suffering. He had to suffer. 
You know, when Jesus was betrayed in John 18, they, they came, they were going to arrest Jesus. And when they did, Peter grabs the sword and cuts off the priest's servant's ear. And Jesus says this, um, put away your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? I know what's going to happen. He knew he was going to suffer. Why did Jesus do it? Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So why can we really be thankful in all circumstances? Because he's already, he's already won. And eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for us. That's why we can always be grateful, even when it's tough. Would you bow your heads, please? You know, the only way this happens is when we stop demanding from God and start really begging from God. And we admit, God, in all of the struggles and difficulties of my life, I need help. I need to be able to cast all my care upon you. I need to know that you care for me. Jesus said one day to the crowd, come to me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. You know, the only way we can have a relationship so powerful as to get us through the hardest of times is to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He is our only hope. He suffered for you. He died for you. He paid for your sin. He wants to redeem you and rescue you. And if you're here today or listening online and you are covered by the sufferings and the hardships and the difficulties of life and you don't know what to do, who to go to, do you know if you will come to Jesus today, if you would receive him, he would save you. He would step into your life. That would make all the difference in the world. So pray with me. Say, God in heaven, I need you. Life's too heavy. Life's too difficult and too hard. But I do believe, God, that you sent your son, Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I believe that that whosoever believes in him should not perish. What a great thing, but have everlasting life. I want that everlasting life. Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sin, and I invite you to come into my life. I need this kind of help. You know, if you prayed, I'd love for you to let me know. Um, you can fill out a connection card if you're in the room, or you could text to the number 94,000. I prayed, and we would like to send you something. Just, just let us know. I mean, acknowledge even where you are today by texting. Something just happened. You said yes to Jesus. How many of you are here today and you, you have stuff you're trying to deal with? It's just hard. It just hurts. You know what I want to encourage you to do? Cast your care. Yeah, that thing you're, you're thinking of right now. 
cast your care on on him because he cares for you. Did you hear that? He cares for you. He will help you. Would you stand please? Lord, we want to thank you for being such a good God. You don't run away from us when we're in trouble. You make yourself available to us. Oh, we believe, even in the middle of the worst of times, that we can give thanks because you are at work. You've got a plan. And ultimately, you will redeem all things. And you will deliver us into eternal life where all of this will be gone. And that is what we give you thanks for today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for church today. If you made any decisions, we would love to hear from you. Text PRAYED to 94000 and we'd love to celebrate with you. We'll see you next time.